As a kid, Scooby-Doo was always around. I mean, I've always liked Scooby-Doo, but I'm not a die-hard Scooby-Dooer. It's something over the years which has just refused to go away. Scooby-Doo has ironically become the real-life equivalent of Scrappy-Doo, just refusing to leave us alone. I love it! And Scrappy. Fight me! Last video, I talked about the first few straight-to-VHS movies, but I also have fond memories of the original era. These shows would air on Boomerang and during the daytime on Cartoon Network, so it was always what was on when I was sick, and I kind of associate it with that. When I was younger, I saw all of the Scooby-Doo shows from the late 60s to the mid-80s, and I kind of all assumed they were one cohesive show. As a kid, it's not really easy to differentiate so many different things with different titles when they all kind of look alike, have similar plot lines and similar jokes. So I wanted to look back at the original series, Scooby-Doo, Where Are You? and kind of describe its flavor when compared to the rest of the Scooby-Doo series. Because just like Scooby Snacks, I think its flavor is undefined. Also, for those of you who thought I coincidentally dressed like Shaggy last time, I don't believe in coincidence. All y'all are playing checkers, and I'm over here playing better checkers. I'm not playing chess because I tried to order a pure white sweater, but it didn't get here in time, so... Fred has black stripes now. But first, this video is sponsored by Verve. Head out to vrv.co slash billium to get a 30-day free trial of Verve Premium. Verve is like one of my favorite streaming platforms, man. And with a great selection of great curated content from great channels like Crunchyroll, Nick Splat, and Boomerang, it's no wonder why Verve always has something interesting to watch. I've had to watch over 130 episodes of Scooby-Doo for these videos I'm putting out. But thanks to the Verve app, I haven't had to to sit down in front of my TV for the duration of it. The Verve app allows you to sync episodes offline so you can watch content while you're not connected to the internet. Meaning I've been watching Scooby-Doo while I'm at the gym and while I'm sick in bed. It's been great. This year, I've been exposed to so many new shows through Verve, including JoJo's Bizarre Adventure and Scooby-Doo Mystery Incorporated, which is the show responsible for me wanting to go down this giant Scooby-Doo rabbit hole. Mystery Incorporated is going to be the next Scooby-Doo video I'm doing. So check it out on Verve and then comment down below so we can, you know, talk about it in the video. At the end of all of these Scooby-Doo videos, I'm going to be doing a mailbag segment and you can use Verve to watch along because I'm announcing what I'm watching in the videos. So participate. It'll be fun. We can watch together. And go to vrv.co slash billium to get a 30-day free trial of Verve Premium. By the late 1960s, Hanna-Barbera had already made a name for themselves. They were considered the worst of the animated world, so naturally they were the best of the animated TV world. With shows like The Flintstones, Yogi Bear, and Huckleberry Hound, they were on top of the other competitor, Filmation. In 1968, the animated band The Archies crushed the charts with Sugar Sugar, and CBS was like, I want that. So they commissioned Hanna-Barbera, who tapped writers Joe Ruby and Ken Spears to create a show about a teenage mystery-solving band. All of the basic elements were there from the beginning. They wanted to have a mystery every episode, like the I Love a Mystery radio program. They wanted a funny tone, but a whore aesthetic, like Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. And they wanted five teenagers, in a band, with their dog, to solve mysteries in between gigs. God, I hate anime. At first, the show was called Mysteries 5, which later became Who's S -S -S Scared, starring characters named after hippie slang. There was Too Much the Dog, WW, and their group of friends, Jeff, Kelly, and Linda. Originally, much of the focus was put on the horror aesthetic. Although it was never supposed to be a scary show, CBS thought it was a little too spoop and they rejected the initial pitch. However, the show eventually shifted focus to WW and the dog character. Head designer Iwao Takamoto, a Disney alumni, got to work and after several iterations, the final design was chosen. A Great Dane, but silly. He had a sloped back, a double chin, and bowed legs, all traits that Great Danes lack, but clumsier dogs have. The name Scooby-Doo was decided based on a Frank Sinatra song, Strangers in the Night. CBS producer Fred Silverman heard the words Doobie Dooby Doo and thought Scooby-Doo, because I guess he didn't bother to read the lyrics. And that's how Scooby-Doo has forever had a name equivalent of getting a misspelled tattoo. The rest of the characters received updates as well. Along with seven-year-old Scooby was his 17-year-old owner, Shaggy. They're constantly hungry and 
consistently cowardly characters who would become central to the show's comedy. There was 17-year-old Fred, named after Silverman, the popular jock-type character and the de facto leader, who owned and drove the team's van, the Mystery Machine. 16-year-old Daphne, the often damsel in distress popular fashionista. And 15-year-old Velma the big bookworm, and huge f***ing dork. Scooby-Doo premiered on September 13th, 1969 on CBS's Saturday morning cartoon block. And despite some competition with Filmation's The Hardy Boys on ABC, Scooby-Doo won out, becoming Hanna-Barbera's most successful show. So f*** off, Bam Bam. Scooby-Doo is known for being incredibly formulaic, and to an extent I agree, but I think that notion is a little overstated. Just a bit. Just a, just a tiny bit. At least this is the perspective I get from watching Scooby-Doo, Where Are You? There are certainly plot beats that happen in every single episode. It's just not as cookie cutter as I remember it being. Each episode has the Scooby gang traveling somewhere for whatever reason. Upon arrival, they find out, usually through a direct encounter or a tip from a local, that some kind of creature, ghoul, monster, or ugly person has been terrorizing the area for some undefined reason. After establishing the location and monster, the gang will split up to find clues. This usually results in Scooby and Shaggy getting into trouble while Fred and Daphne find clues. The clue is usually directly tied into the motives of the character like a piece of treasure. Velma kind of goes back and forth between both groups. The episode's climax usually has Fred setting up a trap, which slowly become more and more complex as the series goes on. Despite Shaggy and Scooby usually screwing up the plan, it always goes in their favor, and the monster is revealed to not be real, but rather someone introduced earlier in the episode who has some reason to disguise themselves to scare people in the town. Season 1 starts with one of the most defined first episodes of television ever. Nearly everything you expect to see from Scooby-Doo happens in What a Night for a Night. They split up, Scooby gets Scooby snacks for being brave, Velma loses her glasses, they catch the bad guy, but he actually says nothing. So not all of the elements are there quite yet. In fact, a lot of the tropes you want to see and a lot of the lore you come to expect isn't as prominent as you may remember. The phrase meddling kids is said less than 10 times, Velma loses her glasses only like six times, and would you do it for a Scooby snack is really only prominent in the first season of the show. Not to say it never happens again, but the show isn't as reliant on these recurring jokes as I expected. It's odd to go back and see personality traits that have been lost. There's some quirky reactions Scooby has and <laughs> <laughs> Shaggy is a top track athlete. Huh. I mean, it makes sense. He is quite quick. Also, I forgot that OG Fred and Daphne were so boring. I'm sorry. So I would not recommend you go back and watch all 42 episodes of Scooby-Doo, Where Are You? There's no grand picture revealed once you've seen it all. I just recommend going and picking a few episodes you remember and watching those. So instead of recommending the whole show, I'm gonna have season by season recommendations. So for season one. Number one, What a Night for a Night. The first episode of the series establishes a lot of the recurring jokes and themes. It's cute and a great first episode. Number two, Foul Play in Funland. The first appearance of Charlie the Robot, a great location of mystery, super fun. Number three, never ape an ape man. Scooby beats the shit out of ape man. It's the first time he goes full power SS3, three Scooby snacks at once, top 10 anime battles. Number four, a gaggle of galloping ghosts. Go now, or abandon all hope of seeing the sun again. You stop that. A really heavy slapstick episode, the gang goes up against some of the classic horror movie villains, Dracula, the Wolfman, Frankenstein's monster. Number five, which witch is a witch? The zombie is a classic Scooby villain, and I love the setting of the swamp. Number six, Spooky Space Kook, my personal favorite villain. I definitely recommend watching this one when you're half exhausted and in a giggly mood. The kook's laugh is what inside my brain sounds like. <laughs> The show does try to change up the locations in every episode. It's not just old haunted mansions or castles. There's beaches, movie sets, airway strips, old amusement parks, etc. Despite this, each episode kind of looks similar because even in broad daylight, it's very dark looking. I'm kind of into it. Scooby-Doo was the invader Zim of its day. I feel like the Hanna-Barbera style is easier to appreciate through a modern lens. A lot of animators throughout the years have criticized how cheap it looks and it absolutely does, but I find it interesting because 
because it opens the curtains to reveal the process. I love how messy it looks. There are seams in between character models and their mouths. The cell layers will have dust in between them that move and rotate with the pieces. Animation errors and off-model characters are regular sights. I love it. It's cool to look back at this animation in crisp HD and see every little ugly detail and every particle of dust. It makes me think about how even cheap animation requires a crazy amount of work. It's very crafty. It kind of reminds me of the South Park pilot. Also, hot take. I love the laugh track. <laughs> Nowadays, they're seen as cheap in telling you when to laugh, but I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. A laugh track is just meant to make you feel like you're watching with a crowd. I know they're cheesy and a bit hokey, but you know what else is? Most of the sitcoms that have them. Sitcoms have simple framing and very little visual storytelling. So the plot and jokes are driven by dialogue, which is not very natural at all but the laugh track helps to create an environment where that's okay. It isn't reality. Because Scooby-Doo recycles a lot of animation, scenes are often framed in the exact same way, episode to episode and scene to scene. Characters walk on what's basically a 2D plane from left to right and then are suddenly stopped in the next shot. This simple framing kind of reminds me of a sitcom set. It's in the same tonal world. The laugh track just helps me accept its cheesiness as something fun. Speaking of cheesiness, season two is where a lot of the classic expectations of Scooby-Doo start to come in. The theme song that everyone knows and loves got a new British Invasion style rendition, which I prefer, but most importantly, season two introduces the montage. Partway through an episode, the monster will chase the gang. A series of visual gags, including the famous door-to-door -door hallway shot is accompanied by original pop song, and I love it, at least for the first few episodes. It was a really fun and cute addition for a moment. It gets old. A lot of the recurring jokes you expect to see are just gone at this point. It's funny because watching these back to back, I see other jokes that recur more than the expected ones. Scooby has this ongoing feud with woodland animals. Velma says, what a ham, a lot. And Shaggy will often tell a joke that Scooby will laugh at, and then he will admit he doesn't get it. There's also this trope that I just despise. So at the beginning of the episode, Shaggy and Scooby will run into the monster and then they'll run back to the gang and be like, oh, we just saw a monster. And the gang will be like, yeah, right. You guys are probably just making it up as if they don't run into a monster like every single week. There, there's no reason not to believe them. Just, just believe them, be nice to them. They're just babies. My recommendations for season two are the following two episodes. Jeepers, It's the Creeper, an essential Scooby-Doo episode. It introduces the most famous creature in the rogues gallery, the Creeper. It's full of great gags and has a great setup. And number two, don't fool with a phantom. I just love the wax phantom's design. Visually, this may be my favorite villain. Season two of Scooby-Doo lasted eight episodes and season three wouldn't air until eight years later. It was technically a revival. In that time, there were a ton of shows that followed the same format. Once Hanna-Barbera found a formula that worked, they milked it for all it was worth. Alongside the rip-offs were two Scooby shows, the new Scooby-Doo movies and the Scooby-Doo show. Season three of Scooby-Doo Where Are You aired on ABC instead of CBS. Although it was a 16 episode production that tried to bring the series back to its roots, the run was canceled after only a few episodes and the last few episodes were aired under the Scooby-Doo show title. And now all episodes of season three are syndicated as such but they are included in the Scooby-Doo Where Are You Blu-ray set. However, they do opt to use the Scooby-Doo show intro as opposed to the season one intro it originally aired with. It's clearly different than the first two seasons. At this point, it was all about Scooby and Scooby was now a full-blown Bugs Bunny clone. I'm not into it. He'll dress up in costumes, mess around with the villain, and is a little more mischievous than he used to be. You can tell he was a merchandising giant at this point. When Scooby was first introduced, for the most part, he was just a talking dog. He would occasionally do things that were certainly not within the physical capabilities of a dog, like grabbing onto things and living after eating a ton of chocolate, but it worked because it was unexpected. As the focus continued to shift to Scooby and Shaggy, they became sillier and even more scary them before. You really need the other three to balance the comedy. However, the other three members of the gang are put on the sidelines in a lot of the episodes, mostly because the creative team thought Fred and Daphne were boring. To which I say, make them interesting. 
Pretty much all the basic tropes are lacking, including the music montage. However, production continued to marginally yet gradually get just a tiny bit better. Occasionally more dynamic shots are included, but they kind of contrast with the more simplistic shots. They basically come out of nowhere. But there are still some good episodes this season. Season 3 episode recommendations. To Switch a Witch is a really good episode. A friend of the gang is suspected to be a witch, so they must solve the mystery before she's burned at the stake. Holy heck, this is the only Scooby-Doo episode with stakes and actual stakes. So there's a sense of urgency to solve the mystery as fast as possible. It's a great change of pace. And the tar monster, just another classic Scooby villain. Of course, I was introduced to Scooby-Doo through reruns and through VHS and DVD releases. But what I didn't know is the version of Scooby-Doo I grew up with was not totally 100% the version that originally aired. When season one first aired, the intro was actually an instrumental. It wasn't until later the famous opening song was used. The intro was added into these earlier episodes for later releases. In order to fit more ad time, rerun episodes were often sped up, which caused some confusion with the creative team making Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island. They were convinced the voice of Fred Frank Welker was no longer able to do the role due to his voice changing. But when they compared the voice to the original version as opposed to the syndicated version, they realized it really hadn't changed at all. Also, there are certain episodes and scenes that I just don't remember seeing as a kid, and it totally wouldn't surprise me if these episodes were either removed for syndication or edited for uh, obvious reasons. <laughs> I mean, that's not appropriate. Don't get me wrong, I'm not like, heck Scooby-Doo, but it's hard for me in 2019 to watch this and to try to put myself in the shoes of a kid watching this in 1970, and I don't think I should. Part of viewing older media is acknowledging it came from a different time, but in order for it to stay in that time and not to continue to perpetuate stereotypes, you actually have to acknowledge it, and that it's wrong. If I can view Hanna-Barbera's animation through a modern lens, I also have to view the jokes through a modern lens. I'm not going to pick and choose. As much as I'd love to heat up my TV dinner Salisbury steak made with real asbestos and lead while watching Dallas and listening to my favorite band who will never break up in order to try to pretend like I grew up in the 1960s so I can have an authentic period reaction to this, I'm unable to. But also, I can't find any info about these episodes being aired now. I'm just curious, it wouldn't surprise me if they were either not aired anymore or just edited. If you know, or have a source, please comment down below. Would you do it for a Scooby snack? Mm -hmm. <gasps> okay, do it in. <laughs> and then I walk in just like Babish. <laughs> Hey, welcome back to Cooking with Billiam, uh, where today we're going to be dissecting the history and making a Scooby snack. So Scooby snacks appeared in the first episode of Scooby-Doo, and I was like, dang, I've seen those before. But one of the questions I was hoping to answer for myself is what is a Scooby snack? So in Scooby-Doo, where are you? The original series, Scooby-Doo snacks, Scooby snacks are definitively dog treats. Shaggy tries them for the first time in episode 5, and everyone is shocked that he likes them. However, in other canons, Scooby Snacks have been other things. They've been human snacks. Uh, they've been named after Scooby. Scooby has been named after them. The, the history is unclear because of all the different canons, and that kind of is reflected within the history of the snack itself. I'm trying to get to the bottom of this thing. I really am. So when I tweeted out, what do you think a Scooby snack tastes like? The answer I was expecting to get, and the answer that I did get a lot, is that they're cinnamon graham crackers. No, the word snack is not on here at all. Scooby Snack is a branded item. I don't remember Scooby being scared to go in like a dark cave or something in the series. He goes, uh-uh, I won't do that. And then Velma goes, oh, really, Scooby? Would you do it for a Scooby-Doo baked graham cracker stick cinnamon made with whole grain by Keebler? That doesn't f***ing happen in the show. Shut up. I like the intensity, keep it going. <laughs> I can't, I really can't. <laughs> <laughs> 
So officially, Scooby Snacks had had uh, many different descriptions in flavors. When uh, Hanna-Barbera were asked about what they believed Scooby Snacks were, they said they pictured it as kind of, you know, a caramel and butterscotch kind of flavor. Uh, they released their own Cartoon Network Scooby Snack branded snack, and they were basically just Nilla wafers with, uh, you know, Scooby-Doo's face on them. And so what I kind of wanted to do here was kind of take all of the different perceptions on what Scooby Snacks are and make two different versions. My idea is to try to perfect this recipe over the course of my Scooby videos. Attempt number one, we're basically gonna make vanilla cookies and flavor one with cinnamon and the other with caramel. This could be a disaster, but who cares? You need one stick of unsalted butter or eight tablespoons, one fourth of a teaspoon of kosher salt, 210 grams of sugar, two full teaspoons of vanilla extract, one tablespoon of milk, 160 grams of all purpose flour, three fourths of a tablespoon of baking powder and one egg white or two tablespoons of egg whites from a container. So first are wet ingredients. Sugar is a wet ingredient because Archie said so. Leave your stick of butter out for about an hour beforehand so it can soften. Measure out your sugar and salt, beat butter, sugar, and salt together until well incorporated. Remove egg white from yolk, beat into mixture, beat in vanilla extract and milk until well incorporated, just like mystery incorporated themselves, whoa. In another bowl, whisk together your flour and baking powder. Slowly add it to the stand mixer or a hand mixer if you haven't been pierced by the stand arrow yet. You don't want the flour to fly everywhere so just a bit at a time. It doesn't seem like a lot of dough, but it will spread out on the cookie sheet a lot, so do not underestimate its surface area. For the cinnamon batch, just add two tablespoons of cinnamon. I did half tablespoons until I liked the taste of the dough, so you can do whatever. Just don't blame me for your salmonella poisoning. For the caramel, you will need one cup of granulated sugar, one fourth of a teaspoon of kosher salt, one fourth of a cup of water, one fourth of a cup of heavy cream, and four tablespoons of butter cubed. Once again, the measurements are in the description. In a saucepan over medium heat, heat up the sugar and salt and cover it with the water. Keep stirring and keep an eye on this. The recipe says five minutes, but you should just eyeball it until the sugar is completely melted. Once dissolved, increase the heat to medium high and keep an eye on it until golden brown. About five minutes or 350 degrees if you have a candy thermometer. Do not stir it in this time. You seem like the irresponsible type, so be sure to keep an eye on it. Once it's ready, remove it from the heat and dump the butter and cream into it and stir until incorporated. Wait for it to cool off a bit, but you still want it to be warm so it's like a liquid. Basically, you're going to pour it into the batter to taste. I did it until I noticed the dough turned a few shades darker. Lay down parchment paper and spread out the cookies pretty far apart. Bake at 350 degrees for about 12 minutes. Just keep an eye on them. You want crispy edges. So the final result is much crispier than I would have liked. The caramel especially has a high sugar content, so it's super crispy on the bottom and very chewy. It's still good though. The cinnamon is very spice and gets lost in the mix a bit. I'll most likely do a cinnamon sugar coat next time and less cinnamon in the actual batter. These are very good cookies, V tasty, but not quite the Scooby snack I was hoping for. Also, I just ordered a dog bone cookie cutter, so next time we try in a few weeks, we're going to get this down. Watching all of Scooby-Doo Where Are You was both a blessing and a curse. I certainly enjoyed getting through it, but it was also a huge chore. It's weird because I think Scooby-Doo is iconic, but I think a lot of the lore goes underappreciated. I was incredibly excited when a familiar monster would show up on screen because I had seen it referenced in other media, merchandise, and other Scooby-Doo shows. It also shifted my perspective on the series because even though the basic plot beats are similar, the show is not as reliant on the same five jokes as I remember it being. All right, so last video, I wanted you guys to kind of comment about uh, Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island and all of those VHS movies. And I wanted you to comment on what the next video was gonna be, which is Scooby-Doo, where are you? So welcome to the Scooby mailbag segment. Next time we're going to be watching Scooby-Doo Mystery Incorporated and we're finishing off the series with talking about what's new Scooby-Doo. So if you have anything to say either about this video or those next two videos, just comment down below with the tag mailbag so I can find it easier. You got a comment from Alice Bob, one, two, three, four. Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island still scares me to this day, yes. The dark aesthetic of those movies is just like, it, it truthfully is creepy and a little unnerving and scary. And I, I, I'm, I, I'm trying to figure out what that is because I don't think that's matched in the later Scooby series. And I think a lot of it has to do with the actual grime uh, of the film and also just the more violent aspects of the film. It's very fleshy and that isn't really portrayed in a, a later Scooby iterations. From Rick W, 
My favorite mailbag is from a gaggle of galloping ghosts where Dracula tries scaring the gang off and Velma just wasn't having it and says, you stop that. You stop that. What I love about Scooby-Doo Where Are You specifically is most of the episodes aren't like laugh out loud kind of stuff. It's just kind of light chuckles. So when something really funny like that does happen, it, it, it hits you harder than any other hilarious show can do because you're just not expecting it to happen. When Scooby-Doo lands a really good joke, it lands very hard. It just doesn't happen that often. So anyways, thank you for leaving all those comments. I'm gonna continue to look through them, continue to read them. And if you want to comment about, you know, anything about Scooby-Doo, where are you from this video or anything about Mystery Incorporated or what's new Scooby-Doo, just comment down below with the tag mailbag so I can see it and find it. Other than that, thank you for watching this video. If this is your first video of mine, please consider subscribing. Check out my other Scooby-Doo video. If you haven't seen it already, uh, like it, share it, do all that jazz. Uh, yeah.